And if there was a gentleman that I could call on for any kind of an opening prayer, it would be Khalil Gibran, uh, a man born in Lebanon. He moved to the United States at a young uh, age. He eventually studied art and literacy. Uh, and he wrote The Prophet, which is one of my favorite books of all time. It's essentially uh, a book uh, about a man who is going to board a ship and he will, uh, that will take him home. Uh, he is stopped by a group of people whom he teaches the mysteries of life. And that, that just takes a few chapter, or a section of the chapter. It's called On Giving. It is well to give when asked, but it's better to give unasked through understanding. And to the open-handed, the search for one who shall receive is joy greater than giving. And is there aught you would withhold? All you have shall someday be given. Therefore give now, that the season of giving may be yours and not your inheritors. You give but little when you give your possessions. It is when you give yourself that you truly give. Greek mythology. 
after I transferred schools and flew away across the country to Oregon, I put the ring away. Twenty years later, I found it and decided, for a reason now lost to me, to have Pegasus removed and replaced by a small diamond. I often look at the ring and remember Pegasus and the long-haired 19-year-old girl whose ring he adorned. The last ring is a diamond ring, which was my mother's engagement ring. I can't wear it now because the stone is loose, but it's always with me in spirit, if not in fact. It's an unusually sparkly and colorful diamond, and when I look at it, I remember the way that it looked shining on my mother's hand. Excuse me. When she read his story, or cooked dinner, worked in her garden, or held my hand, and my mom died a few years ago, so it's a good memory. By themselves, these three rings are nothing more than shiny metal and stone. But it's the stories they tell that matter. The stories are the reasons that I wear the ring, the rings. I hope that whatever ring you have today will have meaning for you. That it will tell you stories, inspire you, spark memories, remind you of a part of you that may be hidden away someday. Whether you wear your ring every day or suddenly find it in a box in the bottom of a drawer, on a lovely spring morning, 20 years from now, I hope that it will remind you of Bill Stewart, of people and places, of ideas and ideals that matter to you now, and of all the dreams that you have today. And that, I guess, is a kind of blessing. My blessing to each of you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
I was thinking about the two classes um, that jointly uh, conduct the ceremony as you got to walk out. And I promised uh, Dr. Foster that I would add haste to my list of virtues, so I, I will attempt to do that. Um, I remembered uh, how many years ago it was for um, the current junior class. I saw them for 90 straight minutes every Wednesday. <laughs> to that class, it was, it was a pretty wonderful thing, really. And then the graduating seniors, they were in the ninth grade humanities class. And so we, in a sense, this group of people and myself, came to this place in this new building together. And so that was a kind of neat for me. Those were outside my final marks. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, things that are circular, things that are linear. This should uh, appeal to the map and humanities crowd. Um, I want to start by telling you that when I was a kid, I used to go to this little town that was called Statesboro, Georgia, which at the time um, had nothing in it except for a college and one bike and two stoplights. And my grandparents lived on a dirt road. Every morning, my grandfather would get up. I went to a visit. They had air conditioning. So in my house, we didn't have air conditioning. Growing up in the South, in a house, no air conditioning is interesting. Basically, you sweat from May until October, and no one thinks anything about it. It's quite unpleasant. But they had air conditioning, and I would, when I was young, put my face against the air conditioner and feel the cold air and believe that this was the best of all possible universes until breakfast was ready. My grandfather used to make this thing called Cheese Monkey. I can't find the recipe. I have it in a book somewhere, and I'm hoping with fervent urgency that it's not one of the boxes of books that I've donated over the years to libraries and other people. But he would make the Cheese Monkey, and it was cheese and eggs and stuff, and it was really good. And whenever I got up, he was, see, he was a magician. Because I get up, I go to the bathroom, I brush my teeth, I wander downstairs, I sleep in my eyes, and instantly breakfast was ready. That very moment. No waiting. Orange juice, cheese monkey, two pieces of toast. Every day. It was the best thing ever. And then he would work the New York Times crossword puzzle while I ate. In my memory, this takes about 10 minutes. And it was the same on Monday and the rest of the days of the week. And he did it in pen. Uh, he taught himself Hebrew in about seven weeks one summer. My father, who had been studying it for years, told me how embarrassing it was to have your father be able to master a language that you in years had not been able to do. Uh, my grandfather went to the University of Georgia, as did his father. And I remember um, when I was in high school, my parents aspired for more. We were in Virginia. They wanted me to go to William and Mary at the University of Virginia. I dutifully applied. I knew where I was going. And I had to do that because the circle had to be made whole. None of my grandfather's children had gone to the University of Georgia. And if I didn't, that would be two generations. And so I knew in my mind that this would have to happen because he meant so much to me. Mrs. Brown almost brought me to tears over and I'm afraid I might get there now by myself, but uh, you guys can't see it, but my grandfather's sitting here and I see the look on his face. And so in that way, we've come full circle. He and I, I and you, but this is also a linear voyage because you are getting ready to be projected out into the world. And all these things for you are going to be new. And I envy you that, because now those are memories for me. And to be honest with you, all I remember about second semester of my senior year is that it lasted forever. <laughs> and I don't have any other memories until graduation, really. And so I would challenge you to be more aware than I was, because as you finish here, you go on that next thing, and this is gone. And yet, it will live within you, as my grandfather does 
and me. So I'm going to miss the seniors, and next year I'm going to miss the juniors when they leave. And the sophomores and freshmen will step forward. And when you come back to visit, the circle will be complete, and yet you will be on a linear projection away from us. And all of those things will be true. And so often in life, it's not the one thing that's particularly true. It's the so many things that are mostly true. And so, I leave you with that thought. Thank you. I'm in 
a room full of 150 teenagers. Graduation and summer break are near. As Patrick pointed out, I guess as everybody pointed out, everything and everybody is in transition. We are all changing. But as we change, as we grow, let us preserve and cultivate the qualities we celebrate here today. Fellowship, loyalty, embrace of the left of center, and love.